Open School of Business. Uh, I'm so happy that you guys been rating uh, and um, reviewing, subscribing. Please keep it up more. It really helps uh, with discovery of the podcast and for other uh, people to learn more uh, and more what we have to offer. Today, I am happy to introduce Terry McDougall. She is um, a marketing professional with so many years of experience. And moreover, she is a uh, career success coach uh, and a work-life balance coach. So uh, today we're going to be talking about how she transitioned from a very interesting and um, fast-paced job as a a marketing executive at a very large bank uh, to actually doing coaching and consulting work. Uh, welcome, Terry. Please uh, start off sharing about your journey of being a business owner. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Anar. It's it's really great to be here. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm an executive and career coach, and I'm an author of a book called Winning the Game of Work. I have been doing coaching and consulting full time since 2017. I uh, left a, a job at a company that I was there for about 12 years, um, and I had a probably about four different jobs heading various areas within marketing. And uh, you know, I would say probably 10 out of the 12 years when I was there, I really enjoyed my job. And then sometimes this happens in your career where you're sort of voluntold that you're going to take a particular uh, position. And it, the last position that I had at my last job was not one that I would have applied for if I had a choice. And I actually tried to say no. <laughs> I didn't think, I did not think it was going to be a good fit. And it actually wasn't a great fit for me. And so I did my my best, um, but I wasn't super happy doing it. And it really led me to uh, kind of reevaluate what I wanted out of my career. And I asked myself a couple questions that I had been advised to ask myself at the beginning of my career, which is what am I good at and what do I like to do? And um, answering those questions back when I first got out of college actually led me to the profession of marketing and I liked marketing. It's, it's a great combination of creativity and analytics, but after doing it for 30 years, I started thinking like, maybe it's time for a change. And so when I looked at myself and I said, what am I good at? And what do I like to do as a marketing leader? I had always thought that it was very worth the investment of time and energy to mentor and coach people on my teams. I mean, it's when you have a high, high performing team, it's good for everybody. It's good for the people that are getting mentored and getting those opportunities to grow. It was great for me because, you know, if you've got people doing a great job, it just makes me look good. And it was great for the company because people were retained. They had, we had really high achieving engaged people working on the team. And I just loved that. And I thought it made a lot of sense to invest my time that way. And I got feedback that I was good at it. I had, I had people that were really engaged. Our employee engagement scores were high for my teams. Um, and I had at one point in my career, actually a couple points in my career, had hired um, career coaches. Um, and so I kind of knew what they did. And so I actually made a decision to leave my job because um, I looked around and I didn't really see any opportunities at the bank that really excited me. I mean, been there for 12 years and just didn't see like a path forward that was interesting to me. And I did, I did do some interviewing during that time, but again, I wasn't really coming across anything that I felt like really floated my boat. So I decided to uh, take it the time I thought of as a sabbatical and figure out what I wanted to do next. I decided to get the coaching certification. And initially I just thought, um, I'll get this skill and then I'll get another job. And maybe as I get closer to retirement, I'll do this full time. But in the eight months that it took me to go through the coach training program and get certified, um, my attitude towards making the leap into entrepreneurship really shifted. And I think that it's mainly because I was surrounded by a lot of other entrepreneurial minded people in my training program. And I just realized, well, why not? Why not now? You know, because 
if for some reason it's not working out, I can always get a job later, but why get a job and not use the skills I just learned? So, um, so I, I've been doing this full time. I mean, left my job in early 2017. I finished my coach training in the beginning of 2018 and I had really my first paying client in 2017 before I even finished with my coach training. And so it's been a good four years, um, four years plus since I've been doing this. And uh, I love it. It's, it's really fun. I love the ability to help people. I love the, um, the fact that I can still have a view into what happens in the corporate world or the business world, because I do work with entrepreneurs too. Um, but I don't have to be in the middle of it. <laughs> you know, I yeah. can, I can kind of <laughs> sit, sit and advise or, or, you know, listen and help my clients, uh, determine what they need to do differently to get the positive results that they're looking for. And right. it's nice to have had that 30 years of experience. I can mine that and I can share my experiences, but, um, you know, it's, have your it's a real... uh, clients uh, mostly been out of your own industry? Actually, no. Your network? I, okay, I have, tell us about I mean, my... your, um, you know, first clients because that's a, always an interesting thing. Well, a lot of people my first fear. clients did come. Yeah. The, the... Yeah, my first clients did come from my network. I mean, the my very first client. I I mean. The job that brought me here to Chicago was to head marketing for the investment bank of a large national bank here in the US. And my first client was an investment banker. So, uh, but it, what, he didn't work for that company, but he was a friend of a friend that I had met at that company. And just with this, this gentleman that I worked with, he, I, I had been telling him you know, what I was up to. And at one point he said, I wanna introduce you to somebody who has had a lot of change in both his professional life and his personal life. And I think that you would get along. And he was my first paying client. And I think that fact that I did understand the investment banking world helped. Um, and then yeah. there were some other people that, you know, when I changed my LinkedIn profile to put my business out there, some people contacted me and said, Oh, I've been thinking about hiring a coach and I see you're doing this. And so, you know, it's really interesting because some of the people that hired me were people that like one client in, in particular was somebody that I met at my first job when I was 22 years old. And we've just stayed in loose contact over the last 35 years. <laughs> and and um, I, I've been very thankful that I was a reasonable young woman when I was in my 20s <laughs> because <laughs> Because people, you know, they got to know me and I guess they, they thought I had a good character and I was right. you know, logical uh, or whatever. Yeah. Because I'm a like very, a, you know, I've grown my, a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like one of my favorite, uh, let's say, celebrity coach, I would say, uh, Marie Forleo. She says oh, that yes. people like buying from people they, li they know, yes. they like, and they trust. So you must have earned yes. those people's trust. And uh, being a marketing professional, it's much easier for you to actually get um, that marketing campaigns going and get. Yeah. Uh, so yes. um, how did you approach that? What what did you do? Like, do you use digital marketing uh, or are there any other venues you used for actually getting more clients that would be outside of your network? Well, I mean, I have been a very active um participant poster on LinkedIn um, and secondarily on, on Facebook. Uh, I launched my podcast a year ago. I've, I've written a book and I've used that as, um, I guess, in, in some ways, a calling card. I've been mm -hmm. on probably north of 150 podcasts since I launched my book. And so that's that's been a big um I guess, channel, if you will. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I is actually kind of maybe interesting and maybe a little, I sh maybe I shouldn't even admit this, but one of the things that I discovered as an entrepreneur is that it was a lot easier being a marketer when I worked for a big corporation, right? Because I yeah. was a marketing director. I had lots of resources at my disposal. I could come up with the strategy and then I had you know, people within the organization that I could reach out to, to actually do the stuff. And when you are a solopreneur, 
you've got to juggle everything yourself. And I will tell you that that's probably not my forte is to do everything. I, you know, I love doing the creative work. I have, I still feel guilty that I don't have like a really logical sales funnel. <laughs> but <laughs> what I will say is that, um, that it's working, you know, I know yeah. it could be better. I know it could be better, but it it's working for me. And, um, you know, I've also, I've also developed multiple channels of revenue for myself, you know, everything from the book I've started, I, I got affiliated with, um, an organization that kind of has a technology platform that enables me to sell larger consulting packages. Um, so I'm starting to do workshops. I'm affiliated with a couple of other coaching companies that actually send me clients, you know, mm -hmm. so once you, once you sort of, um, I always think of it as like leaping out of the, the corporate skydiving jet <laughs> or not jet, but <laughs> plane. Like I, I just remember for, yeah. for actually years, especially when I was not super happy with that last role that I would fantasize a lot about like, boy, I'd really like to jump out of this plane. <laughs> but yeah. I was sort of, I was afraid, you know, it's, <laughs> when you've done it for so long, I was really afraid I was just going to hit the tarmac and go splat. Um, but once you make the decision to do it and you get out into the environment, you start to see all of the opportunities. I mean, I've, I've networked a lot and I've, I've always been, you know, seeking and exploring new opportunities. And uh, so I, I've put together sort of a portfolio approach to uh, earning revenue. You know, some of it comes directly from my LLC. Some of it is me um, working as an affiliate for other businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm I'm always out there trying to optimize. <laughs> I mean, it's true for corporations too. They collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think solopreneurs are exactly the people who should be collaborating more. Yeah. And the authors could collaborate. Imagine you could uh, buy a pack of books that are going to, you know, solve your job to be done, let's say in one area. Mm -hmm. And if you can mm -hmm. cover it with one book, you can surely cover it with five or 10. And if authors can get together and yeah. figure those out and, you know, offer a special price or something, that would be, um, you know, much better deal for the customer. So, you know, I'm happy that you shared your stories about how you do it, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs think that they have to do this one thing and one thing only and that will bring them success and in some cases it is true the more mm -hmm. niche you are and the more you're clear about your messaging and who's your target customer is you just double down on on your talent and you just do it uh, but in some other times you have to go a bit broad because you're still serving the same customer you're just reaching them through different channels and that only amplifies yeah. the impact. So I'm if, if I could, yeah, could I add something there? Sure. Um, because when I was going through my coach training program, they really encouraged us to have a very narrow niche. And I remember just agonizing over that because I have a lot of interests and I, you know, I definitely narrowed it down to like focus on business, right? Not, not to be like a life coach or a dating coach or anything like that, but really to be focused on business and career problems. Um, but I feel like I had to experiment a little bit, right? Get out and, and coach different types of people and see like, well, who do I resonate best with? Who, who's attracted to me? What's the kind of work that I enjoy doing? Um, mm -hmm. I needed to do a little bit of that as experimentation. And I think it can be really easy in the beginning when you're first starting off to feel like you've got to ace everything um, immediately. And really, it's, it, it's a lot of trial and error, you know, and it's, it's trying some things and seeing if you like it, seeing if you're successful. Um, and I, I will admit that I have a little bit of per perfectionistic um, tendencies sometimes. And sometimes I don't want to try things unless I, I believe I'm going to do it perfectly. And what I've found is that just when I try things, Sometimes the opportunities that come along are ones that I didn't expect, but actually end up being really um, positive. 
Yeah, yeah. It's great that you mentioned that because it's through experimentations we actually uh, get the result that we would like. Yeah. So uh, what uh, what are the type of clients that are mostly attracted to you or that you love working mostly with? Well, I, I actually work both with men and women. Um, the people that I work with are definitely high achievers. They're driven, sometimes um, driven to the point of stress and exhaustion and burnout. Um, they typically uh, are working for... Um, you know, corporations and they've, they've moved up in their uh, organizations. And then a lot of times whenever they come to me, it's because they've sort of hit a ceiling in a way, like everything that they've done to be successful to this point is suddenly no longer working. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a old saying that we've probably all heard that what got you here is not going to get you there. And so I help them understand where there might be blind spots to what they need to do differently. Um, and commonly situations might be that um, someone has been like a first line manager with a small team and then they get promoted to be a manager of managers and all of a sudden whatever they used at that first line manager level isn't working for them or they're having to work too many hours or they're not meeting expectations. So just to help them understand how do they up level themselves, how, you know, what are what are the skills that they need to master to be successful at that next level up? A, a lot of times it's really hard for them to see that on their own. And so I really kind of serve as a person that's going to hold the mirror up and help mm -hmm. them see some of the blind spots, you know, things that they might need to do differently in order to have the success that they desire. Right. So if I were to be, you know, one of your clients and um, so my my goal is to move up the career ladder and you know mm -hmm. there's still a couple of positions ahead so i can mm -hmm. come to you for that right and, yeah. and you can yeah. you can point out certain skill set that i'm missing to get to that level mm -hmm. and you do the throughout different industries and fields as well right? i do you know it's funny because my deep areas of expertise are in marketing and financial services. And I have a lot of clients that are in marketing and financial services, but I um, have worked with people, everything from, you know, hyper growth startups to fortune 500 or, you know, even fortune 10 companies. I've worked with every functional area. And it's, it's interesting because in the beginning I wondered like, what, I mean, I can remember even in the beginning when people would come to me from certain you know, say IT or something like, I don't know a lot about IT in depth. Um, but what I found is that the challenges that people have are what they're seeking coaching for is not on IT challenges or HR challenges or operations challenges. It's around people challenges, whether it's right. themselves or how do they interact more effectively with other people. And that doesn't really change that much between different functional areas or different industries for that matter. And at this point, because I've coached across so many different industries and functional areas that, you know, I know enough now about, you know, the automobile industry or um, consulting or, um, you know, uh, biotech, right? I, I, yeah. I'm able to sort of like be a fly on the wall and to see into these different organizations. What about the... Um, uh, um efficiency rate let's say like how many people out of like what the percentage uh out of your clients who have actually got promoted or got that dream job that they were looking for mm -hmm. well I, everybody's goal is different but i I've, I've had plenty of people that you know i start new clients out on a 12-week program and i've had a good number of people who are in job search, get a job within that 12 weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, I will tell you that sometimes I'm even surprised, right? Cause somebody will come and they're like pretty high up, they're well paid. And I realize like the kind of jobs they're looking for aren't on every street corner, yeah. but there's certain, um, there's an approach that I use in my um, coaching, which is getting clear on the goal, 
building that roadmap between where they are and where they want to go, identifying skill gaps, and extremely importantly, shifting their mindset to believe that their goal is possible. If people do all those things, and particularly clear on the goal, take action, and believe it's possible, I've seen like crazy uh, miraculous things happen. Like somebody, you know, I, I always encourage my um, my clients who are in job search to spend a lot more time networking and less, you know, looking at LinkedIn and Indeed, uh, just because the percentages are really low, right? You know, a lot of times you'll look and like 200 people have applied for a job. And <laughs> yeah. uh, unless you've actually done that exact job at a, you know, competitor, mm -hmm. you might never make it through the applicant tracking system screening process. So networking is a lot better way to do it. But I've, I had one client who he was applying, he really wanted to make a bit of a large pivot from what he was doing. And he had applied for lots of jobs and wasn't making any progress. And I really encouraged him start networking. And um, he had coffee with somebody that his father in law introduced him to was not wasn't a job interview or anything. But by the by the end of the coffee, he had a job offer. Um, mainly because uh, this guy was a partner in an accounting firm. And once he got to know my client, he, he recognized that they had a hole in the middle of their firm that my client filled perfectly. They didn't even have a job opening, but he was like, you know, you check so many boxes for what we need. I'm just going to offer you a job. And when he called me, I was like, oh my gosh, wow. You know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't envision that that, that was, was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and but I, I, I you know, That's the job with a lot of clients. Yeah, it's awesome. And the job seekers is, you know, you you have the goal there and, and they will be looking and the more they apply, the more the likelihood that, you know, they get yeah. something. Uh, what about uh, a request within the companies where a person wants yeah. to grow within their own company, but they're maybe stuck in, in some kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it could be stigma. It could be where they already put in a box. A lot of people yeah. complain about that. And yeah. they're like, I really love my company, but you know, yeah. they see the way they see me They there's this whole loop and they all, and sometimes I see that it's actually not them, but sometimes client, most of the time, <laughs> the person itself, like himself or herself, where they can't flourish. But how do you help people like that? Where there are a lot well, of limiting beliefs and where there are a well, lot of history yes. with the company as well. So yeah, a bit more complicated one. Yeah, it, it is. And it's, you know, when people come and they're having pain, you know, with, with what's going on at the company, um, I always listen, you know, so we can understand like what might be the issues, what might be the opportunities for them to do something different. And I always challenge them in the beginning to really step back and say, what can they do differently? Right. And we'll work on that. Um, but sometimes what they may realize is that the environment is such that they're not going to be able to grow there. I mean, there's a lot of toxic environments out there. Sometimes people blame themselves because they're not successful in their organization. And it's, you know, in the beginning, I'm never going to like, well, first of all, it's not up to me to say, oh, that's a toxic environment, right? It's up to me to say, let's step back and see what you can do, what how you can influence this. Uh, but if they've tried a bunch of different things and things aren't really working, and then maybe the next step is to question whether that's the right place for them to pursue their goal. Because very often, um, competitors might actually value you more than your current company. I mean, that actually happened with me, um, where the company that I worked for before I came to Chicago, um, I was up for a promotion and they opted to hire somebody outside to take that promotion rather than me. And the day I found out that I didn't get the promotion, I actually got a call from a recruiter, which started this whole process of me interviewing outside the company. And, you know, within a few months, I had uh, two offers that were for a lot more than what I was currently making. And I was interviewing with another company. And 
I ended up taking the job that brought me here to Chicago and they were so excited. They were like really impressed with my background and it just felt so good to actually walk into a company that valued me versus, you know, my old company valued me, but they didn't see me as the leader that I saw myself and the company that I came to here in Chicago, they took me as a leader from, you know, the first uh, day that I started there. And so sometimes, you know, maybe just a change of scenery, is, <laughs> you know, to go someplace where people value you, that might be what's required. Um, yeah. But so I'll, I'll give you an example of a client that um, actually I'm still working with him, not as frequently as I did in the first, you know, couple years, but he is very high achiever. Um, he was he's kind of in a, a sales type role and um his boss had promised him a promotion and a raise but she was not pulling the trigger on it and one of the things that we uncovered in our work together was that he had a lot of resentment about the way his boss assigned work to him um his perception was that if she came to him and asked him for something that he needed to drop everything and respond to that immediately. And he was very frustrated by that because he felt like it really threw a monkey wrench into things that he already had in process. And, you know, I really challenged him to say, you know, is your perception of her expectations true? You know, maybe what you can start doing is asking her when she expects it rather than you just assuming she expects you to drop everything. And, what he found is that, you know, if he thought about it and he said, well, can I get that to you on Monday? That she was actually like, oh yeah, that's fine. And within like two or three weeks of him starting to implement this new way of managing up to his boss, he got promoted. And I really think that the reason why she was holding off on promoting him was because she sensed a little attitude that she could see that he was talented. She could see that he was bringing the results, but she did not feel comfortable with their interactions. Mm -hmm. But once he realized that he had more control than what he was stepping into, um, and he, you know, he was kind of taking responsibility for making it work for him, that she promoted him. Yeah. And so sometimes it can be as simple <laughs> as that, that it's just like, what is it that I could be doing differently? Like, yeah. one of the things that people tend to do is say, like, they'll say things like, um, well, they won't let me do that. And you have to stop sometimes and say, well, who is they, right? Because we can impose rules on ourselves that aren't true. And, and actually with, with that particular client, there was something that was really interesting about him and he, he had been a track athlete and he, you know, was used to, you know, coaches you know, being very um, unforgiving, if you will, like if they told him to do something, he was supposed to do it right then. Mm -hmm. And so he was bringing his past experience into the workplace and just assuming that anybody in a position of authority that he had to, you know, if they said jump, he'd have to say, well, how high immediately. Mm -hmm. Right. And that wasn't, that was something that he was bringing into yeah. that. That wasn't actually something that his boss was imposing on him. Mm. So um, that's amazing. You know, I love that story. Because yeah. It just shows how much of a mirror the whole world might be. Yes. And obviously, if we're not smiling, no one is smiling back. <laughs> right. That's so yeah, that's so simple. true. I bet yeah. you his boss didn't. I bet if if we had gone to her and said, why haven't you promoted him yet? She might not have even been able to articulate it because I think it was probably hitting it almost a subconscious emotional level because of his the energy he was bringing some negative energy into their interactions and then once he let that go they could have more positive interactions and i think she probably felt like oh you know to your point um that she knew like and trusted him right she felt like oh i can trust him that he's not going to have an attitude mm -hmm. um yeah yeah emotionally leveled person is always you know you don't like unpredictable things in business and, and yeah. I'm sure in any workplaces people don't like unpredictable people so or <laughs> or sure. people um that 
that cause friction or yeah. drain energy. I, I was actually interacting with one of my clients this morning who has someone on her team that she's, her, the person on her team is probably performing at expectations, but she's really passive aggressive. She's um, kind of uncooperative, tends to make excuses. And, you know, she was just saying that she thinks she's going to give her a uh, meets expectations. And I was like, well, I mean, obviously that's up to her and her boss to decide what the right rating is. But I said, you know, there's somebody can actually be doing their job, but maybe they're draining a lot of energy. They're taking a lot more energy to manage because of how they're approaching their work. You know, they're not as collaborative. They're, you know, always throwing a monkey wrench into things. And I think that that needs to be taken into consideration. And I also think that, you know, for those of us who might be being resistant to guidance, that we need to look at ourselves and say, you know, could I be doing something differently to get to get along with people better, to be more collaborative, cooperative, to provide more value? You know, sometimes we need to look at ourselves too. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, that is the benefit of working with a coach because a lot of times uh, at work, you'll get 360 uh, degree feedback, mm -hmm. but even that one can be very, very nice in nature. Uh, in yeah. a way where you can't really pinpoint to your real disadvantages to your real things that you you know areas for improvement mm -hmm. or or maybe they will be very constructive but again those things like your energy and how people perceive you are you mm -hmm. joy to work or are you kind of a pain in some place to yeah, work you know well, and that you, you know, can't really tell to a person because yes. it's not constructive it's feedback. hard well yeah. it's hard and you know i always try to help people also to realize that they're showing up in the way that they do for a reason right they've developed a coping mechanism at some point in their life that helped them deal with a situation that they've encountered in the past and you know much like my client who had run track right yeah he developed that johnny on the spot exceed expectations do it now attitude because that helped him to be successful in track he brought that into the workplace and that helped him be successful until it didn't right that yeah. that probably when he was a more junior person they were like oh you know he's doing such a great job look at him he's johnny on the spot he's you know exceeding expectations but when it got to that point where he was reporting directly to the senior level person and she was sensing the resentment right mm -hmm. that and that wasn't serving him anymore um so sometimes we have to dig in and say where's that coming from and is it serving me well now maybe it served me well in the past but maybe i need to let it go and change my outlook because this is a different situation than when i was in high school and college and running track <laughs> right right uh, i also um uh, like that you mentioned that some of your clients come and they hit the ceiling and there's nowhere else to grow you mentioned that and mm -hmm. I was thinking, how did they even come to you? Because at that point, the natural thing to do would be either retire or uh, close down this shop and find a complete new passion, new career or start a mm -hmm. business. How do they end up seeing you? I'm curious. Well, I mean, I'll, most of them are well short of the age where they could retire. Right. And and even I've coached a lot of people in their 50s and even people in their 50s, you know, if you're 55, you could still work for another 17 years. You know, like a lot of times people don't they want to keep doing something. And so. Um, it it really depends on the situation, like sometimes, you know, people are just feeling the pain of. I've kept doing the same thing that I thought would make me successful. It's made me successful up until now and I'm doing it now and I'm not getting the same results that I've gotten in the past. And, you know, what do they say? Like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And some people have enough wherewithal to recognize 
it's not working anymore. What, what do I need to do differently? Um, but also a lot of people that I work with, their companies give them coaching. Now, the vast majority of people who whose companies pay for coaching, they're doing it as an investment in that person. It's not, you know, kind of a um, corrective action or anything. It's really more like you're doing good and we want to invest in you because we want you to stay here and continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes people don't know how to plot their path from where they are to the next level. Um, and to get promoted, a lot of times we've got to step out from our comfort zone. We might need to volunteer for a project or volunteer. Like I actually got a lot of um, face time with senior executives in my last company by volunteering on the United Way campaign because there's always some very senior level executive who's the chair of the campaign. And if you volunteer to work on the campaign and then you're going to have a lot more face time with those people and they get to know you and then if you do a good job they're you know next thing you know they're calling you and saying hey terry i have another project that you'd be great for right and they might have never known me or known my name had i not kind of stepped in a little bit into the spotlight um i've i've seen it a lot in my career where sometimes i would offer those kind of opportunities to people on my team and some of them would be like i'm too busy i can't do that which is fine, but it can be a shortcut to getting the exposure within the organization that you'll need in order to be promoted. Because typically from a promotion standpoint, it's not just your boss that makes that decision, especially in big companies. Like if I had somebody that I wanted to promote, I'd have to make the case to my boss. And a lot of times it would have to be discussed at the senior leadership meeting, you know, where we're actually, I might put forward the people on my team that I wanted to be promoted and other people would be doing the same thing. And, you know, they might say, oh, we're only going to promote, you know, five people out of the 20 that everybody is recommending. And so if nobody knew the people on my team, they might not get the opportunity because there wouldn't be consensus yeah, among yeah. the leaders. It's like very similar to when you're a business owner and you have reviews on Google or Yelp. Yeah, and, uh, yeah exactly. Either people know you and, and they they know about you uh, or, or you're unknown. And then in that case, you will have much less um, a likelihood of uh, you being picked, basically, yeah. even if you're a business or if you're an employee at a corporate uh, organization where mm -hmm. the same rule applies basically you have to watch you know your behavior and provide value and also make sure that value is seen and measured yes. by the people mm -hmm. who would be hiring um, in the next for the next projects so um, you know we talked about about your um, marketing journey your uh, coaching journey, your clients, how you help them. I'm wondering uh, what is your um, like vision for future? What is your mm -hmm. personal vision, vision for your, uh, 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 for your company? And uh, most of all, uh, do you ever think about uh, you know, if I were in corporate, I would be, you know, with all the knowledge you have, you could have been uh, even in higher positions in marketing and, and even mm -hmm. CEO and things like that. Does it cross your mind? And, and when it does, what do you do? Because I feel like a lot of high achievers, they always have this, oh, if I were here, I would have been this. <laughs> but then, you know, I have my own business, but and then it's giving me uh, so yeah. much money. So it's like, how do you get that balance and be at it's, peace it's, with yourself? <laughs> yeah, that's funny because one of my clients, she's always saying like, oh, I look back and I, all these people that I used to work with, yep. they're at these like really high levels and I'm not as, which she actually has a very impressive career. I, I think we have a tendency to judge ourselves a lot more harshly than other people judge us. But, you know, I always had the ambition of becoming a chief marketing officer. That was really my aspiration. And when I worked at my last company, the higher I rose and the more I was actually in the room with the chief marketing officer for the entire company, 
I realized that I didn't want that job <laughs> because it was different than what I thought the CMO role would be that the CMO actually did not do a lot of marketing. You know, she had many kind of, we actually had a lot of CMOs reporting to the CMO, <laughs> CMOs for particular businesses because the company I work for had 46,000 people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, marketing had hundreds of people. Um, like my, my boss had 125 people in her, you know, department. And then there were like maybe three other people at her level. And, and then the, the chief marketing officer for the company was over that. So as I got closer to that role, I just realized I don't, I don't really want that. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think that it's, it's a trade-off, frankly, because when I worked in corporate, I got direct deposit every two weeks. I got a nice fat bonus. I got equity awards. I got to travel for business. Um, you know, there were just really a lot of nice perks that came along with it. But there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of headaches and a lot of politics that come along with it as, as well. And, you know, when I would think about what I really got my own satisfaction out of, and I, I thought a lot about this before I started my business, my satisfaction came from interacting directly with the business leaders, understanding their problems, sort of co-creating with them what the strategy was going to be for marketing to execute upon. And when I think about being a coach, that's pretty much exactly what I do now. It's I'm working with people to understand their problems, to brainstorm on what that solution would look like, and then walk along on the journey with them to help make that happen. And that's that's really where my passion lies, is being able to make that real tangible difference in somebody's life. And by extension, in the companies, um, I am starting to um, get into consulting with companies as well. I um, have a, a large proposal out with a client right now where it's going to be coaching the senior most people in the company. Uh, there's a, a technology training aspect to it where every week there's a, a very short training module that each of the leaders will go through. Each month I will come in and do a workshop. Um, and, you know, so it's kind of a multi-level initiative that it's really about starting to change the DNA of the culture of the organization. And I'm, um, you know, when I talked with the president of the company, one of the things that we talked about was, you know, we're starting at the top, but because of the technology platform, there's an ability to scale this for more people within the organization and really cascade it so that um, everyone is trained on this new way to approach cultural interactions within the company. And um, the whole idea is that they can tap more fully into the potential of all of their employees. So that's, that's what I'm starting to get into. Wow, and, exciting. Um, and it's that's exciting. That's an entrepreneurial yeah, journey. Really exciting. I love when uh, yeah. coaches and entrepreneurs, solopreneurs especially, leverage the tech part to really scale their business and yeah. give bigger value to their clients. So thank you um, so much, Terry, for uh, an honest conversation about your own personal story and uh, about all things business uh, at your company. And you know, you talked about collaboration projects you do with other companies. So it's really amazing. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed speaking with you.